Uh, <clears throat> okay, we're going to pick up where we left off, and I'm going to skip over a few things here uh, because there's uh, some of it is a little, I think, a little bit redundant. But nonetheless, I, it, usually I repeat myself because I maybe I'm not being very good at communicating what I want to communicate. So I say it again. Maybe it'll work better the second or third time. <laughs> uh, anyway, so. Um, so the whole question again that we want to uh, uh, look at is um, what the state of things is relative to this conversation about morality and ethics and uh, what we can conclude, I think what we conclude about this is first of all, generally most people today uh, who think, if they think at all about morality and ethics, uh, usually end up appealing to what we call the principle of intuition. A principle of intuition. This is a person, this is your neighbor, and this is a professional philosopher. Okay, the appeal to intuition. And second feature of modern moral thinking is the way it handles reason. The way it handles reason. Uh, and the third characteristic of it is its inability to settle questions of priority between different rival moral claims. That is, which should be the most important point as opposed to the second most important point and the third most important point. So there's an uh, uh, inability to come to a conclusion about what should be the most important point versus what should be the second or third most important point. And that is seen, these seem to be typical characteristics of the way most modern people think about morality and ethics. It's appeal to intuition. It's the way it views reason as a way of uh, arbitrating between different views, and then how you pick the most important thing uh, to work for in your moral claim, whatever that moral claim might be. And so the, we know that uh, intuition is one of those things like, you know the word intuition, you know, like women have more intuition than men do. <laughs> Uh, there's a sort of an intuitiveness, okay, I know that sounds sexist, but that's tough. Anyway, uh, there's a certain intuitive characteristic uh, that I found in my life of whatever number of years, uh, that women have a sort of intuitiveness about things, that men tend to be more tactile and more obvious, and, uh, but, but um, as far as morality goes, generally speaking, most people operate out of an intuitive sense of right and wrong. Intuitive. It doesn't feel right. That feels right. Okay? So it's, that's, that's what we mean by intuition. A kind of intuitive sense of right and wrong. And, uh, and, and that, of course, is not an adequate way to determine whether something is or is not good or bad, right or wrong the way it makes me feel about it, my intuitive sense about it, that's not a terribly helpful way to deal with differences of, of morality uh, <clears throat> because intuitions vary from person to person. The intuitions vary from group to group or culture to culture. So once you get into the intuition thing, well, you know, all bets are off. It can go any direction. It can go all the directions at simultaneously. So intuition has proven to be an inadequate way of... Even secular philosophers admit that intuition leads to more chaos, not to more order. But they still can't go anywhere else. Why? Because to go anywhere else outside yourself leads you to what? I mean, it, it leads you to some dimension of reality that is not under your control, which would be the God dimension, the transcendent dimension. And they don't like that idea, so they don't want to have anything to do with it. So they're stuck with intuition. And the way they handle reason, when I was teaching uh, ethics at uh, the uh, Air War College in the United States, which is a part of the Department of Defense, uh, I was teaching uh, uh, military ethics to uh, officers, whatever. And uh, the most popular way to teach ethics was to teach it in what they call uh, decision theory. Decision theory. And what decision theory is, it says there is no right or wrong. 
the emphasis should be on how you achieve your result. And that means the more methodical the process, the more likely you are to choose the right thing. So it's decision theory, making decisions in an, uh, a reasonable, rational, logical way will lead you to the best outcome. Which, of course, is exactly what the Nazis did in, in World War II. They were the most reasonable decision theorists you could ever imagine because they took the Industrial Revolution and all that came with it of you know, Henry Ford's assembly line and created the perfect storm of a holocaust. So they were real good at decision theory, but they did it absent any moral standards beyond those that were most pleasing to themselves. So the moral decision theory or decision making theory proves itself to be inadequate as well for anything meaningful in terms of community and how we live. And so and so in the end, neither of those is going to be helpful to us. Neither of those is going to be helpful to us. Uh, even the idea of, say, if you just tell somebody, well, be a principled person. Well, what does that mean, to be a principled person? It means to have principles and operate on the basis of those principles. Well, which in particular? Which principles in particular are we supposed to adopt? And how will we measure success or failure based on those? Eh, there's no way to really know. There's really no way to know. So that itself is... You know, an unprincipled person can be consistent. You are a consistently unprincipled person. What's wrong with that? You're consistent. So this becomes a real problem. Also, nobody ever gets around to asking the most important questions. The most important questions, which are those most basic premises that guide us in everything that we do. Nobody ever wants to talk about those things because that gets us into... God language, God things, and people want to avoid that as much as possible because they see God as a divisive topic, a divisive subject. So we don't want to talk about God. Everybody has a version of God, and how will we ever know which version is the right version? And so that takes God out of the thing as well. And so... Uh, what we need to appreciate is how deep the roots go that lead us to the circumstance we find ourselves in. Why, in effect, when you read books on morality, the, the best part of the book is its tearing down of a rival argument. Okay? The negative over a positive. You read all of these philosophers, modern and ancient even, they're so good at destroying their opponents. That's called a negative argument. And they're good at it. They're really good at it. But they never give you anything when they're through. It's like if you read Socrates' dialogues, they're just fascinating how sophisticated Socrates is in destroying the arguments of his opponents. He's really incredibly brilliant. But you can't live based on Socrates' philosophy. There's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing there. So you're going like, so you can be really good at knocking down a guy's argument, but you don't give me anything to live with. So I'm just stuck being clever. And that's what Socrates, he was stuck. He ended up dying because he was so clever. And, uh, and so that's basically all you get. So you read all of these philosophers, Kant and all these brilliant philosophers, and they never give me anything in the end to live with. I, I mean, other than to say how bad that argument was that so-and-so presented to me about this particular issue. So that's the case today. Everybody can be good at knocking down someone else's argument, but they can't give me anything in its place that's going to be life-sustaining and life-directing in terms of morality. So, that's where we are. My question then is, what can the Polynesians teach us about the problem? You're going, Polynesians? <laughs> what can the Polynesians teach us about the problem? Now, I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Okay? And I want you to imagine a place. It's blue sky, blue waters, palm trees, sun. Are you imagining with me? Are you with me on that? You're working on that? Okay, now open your eyes. 
<laughs> Don't you wish you were there right now instead of here? Of course you do. And so do I. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to be there laying on the beach uh, on the top of one of those sailboats thinking, oh, this is really nice. Anyway, so what can people who live there teach us about how we got where we are here? Okay, and much to your surprise, hopefully it will be you'll be disabused of that surprise, they can teach us a lot about how we got to where we are today. Because they perfectly replicate the Western European way of thinking that produces what we have today. And that is found in the Polynesian Islanders. Now <clears throat> Who can we thank for this? Well, he was a British explorer by the name of Cook, Admiral Cook. Okay, have, you, have, have any of you ever seen the show uh, on British television called Inspector Morse? Yeah. You ever seen that? Yeah. And you remember what his first name was? I've never told it. Except at the very end. Somebody guessed it. Ah. And then now they've made a new series about him when he was young before he became Chief Inspector Morris. And the name of the series is Endeavor. Okay? He was named for Admiral Cook's ship, which was called the Endeavor. Ah, that means nothing to our class, but I just thought it was an interesting thing. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Admiral Cook made his third voyage to the Polynesian Islands in 1776 for about three years. And uh, he uh, records uh, he, the first discovery by English speakers of the Polynesian word taboo. Taboo. No one had ever heard the word before Cook went to the Polynesian Islands on his third uh, voyage. And what they discovered, the sailors who were with Cook discovered, they were astonished. Uh, if you know anything about the Polynesians, they have very bohemian sexual lifestyles. Very anything goes, all right? So it doesn't matter. Sex is just whatever you want to do, with whomever you want to do it, whenever you want to do it. Nobody cared when you did, who you did, or what you did. It was all about this laissez-faire view of sexuality. But, paralleled with this laissez-faire view of sexuality, there was a rigorous set of rules of prohibitions placed between the conduct of men and women when eating together. So you could sleep with anybody and everybody, but you couldn't eat together. And they, they, they scratched their heads and they thought, yeah, I don't quite get this. This one area, which you'd think would be the most important area, is completely open for grabs. But then, man oh man, meals, eating, mm, got rules here, and they're vigorously enforced. So they ask, uh, why is it that men and women are prohibited from eating together when they can do anything else they want together? Why are they prohibited from eating together? And they were told that that practice was taboo. Ever heard that word? Mm -hmm. Taboo. Taboo. It's taboo. Ah, okay. So eat, men and women eating together would be a taboo. It would be a violation of a taboo. Okay, so what would be the first question you as the intrepid explorer would want to ask and answer? What's a taboo? Right? What is that taboo thing you're talking about? So, <clears throat> uh, what is a taboo? What does the word taboo mean? Well, when they ask what the word taboo meant, they didn't know. <laughs> they couldn't answer. It's taboo. Yeah, but what does taboo mean? It's just taboo. Oh, well, that's interesting. In other words, it didn't simply mean prohibited. It meant more than that, but nobody could tell them exactly what it meant. So to say that something was taboo, whether it be a practice, a person, or a theory, is to give some sort of reason for its prohibition. But what kind of reason for its prohibition? Well, 
two dilemmas emerged. Two dilemmas emerged. First, the significance of the fact that Cook's seamen were unable to get any intelligible reply when they asked the question of what taboo meant from their native informants. Nobody could tell them what it meant. Well, then what would that suggest? Well, they didn't really understand the word they were using. If you can't supply me with a definition, you must not know what it means. But you're using the word. That's taboo. What is taboo? It's taboo. Okay. So that would suggest they didn't really understand what the word meant that they were using. And that was, and that, as we see historically, is reinforced by the fact that when King Kamehameha, Kamehameha the second, uh, abolished all the taboos. 40 years later, no one noticed. Now you would think these taboos, if somebody took them away, would create chaos, moral chaos in the, on the islands, right? People would be going, oh, there are no taboos, what are we going to do? Oh, we're just do whatever we want to do. We can eat together, we can do whatever we want to do. But it had no effect when they took away the taboo laws. People were scratching their heads again. Hmm, how could they come to be using a word which they really didn't understand? Well, two anthropologists, Barry Douglas and Franz Steiner, uh, through their research, found that taboo rules characteristically have a two-stage history. A two-stage history. So in stage one of their history, they're embedded in a context that confers intelligibility upon them. In other words, they become something repeated so often that they simply make sense. Nobody knows why, but they seem to make sense. They're part of the culture now. They're part of the routine. They're part of the community habit. So they sort of seem reasonable. Of course we do these. If you think of it, for example, of the taboo rules of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, they do what? The taboo rules, the avoidance rules of the book of Deuteronomy, if you will, presuppose a cosmology, a world, made by God, and within that world there are scales of importance of things that are important. And so the book of Deuteronomy assumes that Yahweh made the world and he's created a world that operates according to certain principles. And here are the principles, a taxonomy is a classification of those principles, and the book of Deuteronomy spells all those out for you. There they are, right? Makes perfectly good sense. If you're an Israelite, you don't go, I wonder where the stars came from. Uh, no, the Israelite, Yahweh made everything. He spoke and the heavens were formed. Of course, it's all His world. And of course, things work according to the rules that He's established in His creation. Of course, everybody understood that. So you have a covenant relationship with that God, a personal God, and all these things work the way they're meant to work. So once the rules are embedded, in a particular context, a particular place, a particular people, they become obviously understandable. People don't get up in the morning and go, I wonder why the sun rises and doesn't set. You know, I wonder why it rises now and sets You don't get up and ask those questions. It just does what it does, and everybody abides by it. In other words, the context confers intelligibility. Context confers intelligibility. So, what happens? If you deprive the taboos, if you deprive the taboos of their original context, they are at once apt to appear as arbitrary. In other words, context keeps them from appearing arbitrary. Absent context, they appear arbitrary. They just are. We don't know why. We don't even... Eh. They just are. And, oh, they're arbitrary, I guess. That's why no one could define taboo. No one could... Def they couldn't remember where it came from. There was no way for it to be reasonable. or They didn't know the content. They didn't remember any of that. So... 
Once you lose the context, you lose the ability for them to sound sensible, intelligible, reasonable. And so they can easily be abandoned and forgotten without any social disruption whatsoever, which is precisely what happened when King Kamehameha II abolished all the taboos. Nobody noticed. They just were gone and nobody cared. They didn't care anymore. It didn't make sense to them anyway. It was gone. That's the first stage. The second stage is that once those rules or once those taboos have been deprived of status that can secure their authority, both the interpretation of those rules and their justification becomes debatable. Originally, no one would have debated the tab taboo rules. They would just assume them to be the case and this is what we do. But once you deprive them of their context, where they came from, then anything's open for debate. Of course you can dispute the taboo. Of course you can argue about it if you want to. No big deal. So when a culture's resources are too weak to carry through the task of reinterpreting the rules that have been around for generations, then the task of justifying the rules becomes practically impossible. Practically impossible. And so you have the relatively easy victory of King Kamehameha II over all the taboos. What do I mean? Once you deprive something of its original context, which gives it its meaning, you create a vacuum, a space, a vacuum, where it can mean anything. It doesn't matter anymore. So then you're willing to embrace almost anything, like King Kamehameha II's abolishing of the taboos. Nobody cared. So in the case of Hawaii, once you create a vacuum, you no longer have the taboo rules, what did the Hawaiians do? Well, read James Michener. Ever read that book, The Hawaiians? About missionaries, New England Puritan missionaries going to Hawaii? Well, once they abolished the taboo rules, all the Hawaiians wanted to become New England Puritans. They started wearing the clothes of the New England Puritans. They started doing all the things the New England Puritans did, all the missionaries did. They looked for all intents and purposes like New England Puritans, although they were Hawaiians. Because there was a vacuum, a space there, where all the things they once believed no longer had any value to them. They didn't make any sense to them anymore. The context originally was gone. So the taboo, nobody could even define taboo anymore because it had been so abstracted from its original implanting in the culture that it didn't make any sense anyway. So why not become a New England Puritan? Why not insist that if a woman gets married, she has to wear a white dress? Of course, that's what the New England Puritans do. Why? It doesn't matter. Just do what they do. So what are taboo rules? What are taboo rules? They are a survival from some previous, more elaborate cultural background that has been forgotten. They are a survival of some previous, more elaborate cultural background that has been forgotten. And so the only true theory of any set of taboo rules is one that exhibits their intelligibility at any particular moment. If it doesn't exhibit their intelligibility, they become easily abandoned and people forget them. So the only adequate true theory will be the one that will both enable us to distinguish between what is for a set of taboo rules and practices to be in order and what it is for them to be fragmented and in disorder. So a true theory would explain the difference and why the difference is important. But without that, they're just random, arbitrary ways of doing things. Men don't eat with women. Why? Nobody remembers. But we don't eat with women. That's taboo. But why? I don't know. We never eat with women. But why? I have no idea. I don't remember. Do you remember? I don't remember. Granddad, do you remember? I don't remember. How far back do you go? Nobody remembers. Why? Because the original context, which gave meaning to the taboo rules, is now no longer present. It's no longer available. So nobody can explain them anymore. Nobody even understands what they are. So why not get rid of them and try something new? So that, I believe, enables us to understand 
the historical transition by which a later state, that is our state today, disorder and fragmentation when it comes to morality, emerge from a former ordered cosmos. You see, the Christian tradition has been forgotten. So the rules of the Christian tradition make no sense at all. They are simply arbitrary rules people have picked out. The so when your grandchildren one day go, why did grandma pray before the meal? I don't know. Why did she do that? I don't know. Everybody did that. Why'd they do it? I don't know. I don't remember. Why do people pray before they eat? I don't know. Oh, it's just grandma. She just liked to do that before she ate. Nobody even remembers why. And so, let's stop praying before we eat. Why not? Who cares? Nobody even remembers why they did it in the first place. Well, this is the world we live in. Christianity, if you think of it as a set of taboos, has been so abstracted from its original context that it seems totally random and arbitrary. So why care? Why care? Why value marriage? Why? Who cares? I don't even remember why people did that before. Why not kill your unborn offspring? Who cares? What do you mean? Uh, image of God? Where did that come from? What is that talking about? You see, once that happens, all bets are off in terms of a culture and what it ends up doing vis-a-vis -vis its morality, its way of thinking about good and bad. And so the only way you can reintroduce these terms to your culture is by reintroducing the historical context of the rules. So when you're teaching your children to pray, do you simply this say, this is what we do before we go to bed. Get down on our knees, put our hands together, and say, thank you, God, for a great day, and I hope I have another good day tomorrow. Or do you go, darling, let me explain to you what prayer is, why we do it, why it's important, and who authorized it. Ah, now you're telling your children this isn't something we simply do. This is something that's rooted and connected with God's creation, God's love, God's redemption, God's care, and His willingness to communicate with His people. And so your children grow up realize they're actually communicating with God, and that's just not talking to themselves. See that, But when that is left out, it just simply becomes a habit. It's something we do. We pray before our meals. We don't ever remember why we do it, but you know, that's what people seem to want to do, and that's why we continue to do it. So, contemporary moral philosophy, I'm convinced that contemporary moral philosophy is really just a version of Polynesian taboos. It's just a version of Polynesian taboos. Why should we think about thou shalt not kill any differently than they thought about a taboo that said men and women couldn't eat together. What's, 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 what's the so you try explaining to people today something that has no connection with any historical reality. It's just like telling them men and women don't eat together. Or men and women wear this or that or whatever it might be. It seems random. It seems arbitrary. So you walk into a university and you talk about good and evil and people go, where'd you get that idea? Well, I like to think of it differently than you do. It's all random. It's all arbitrary after all. It's all made up. Everybody's just making it up as they go along. We all know that. So all of the things we talk about, about morality, goodness, and evil as Christians, are really terms which I like to call surviving terms. They survive, but they've been disconnected to their historical context. So they're just words we use. They survive in our language, but they have no context and no rootedness in any historical reality. And that makes moral conversation very difficult and very awkward for a believer talking to a non-believer. If they survived, what did they survive from? What did they survive from? And so all of the moral words we use today, all of these vocabulary terms we use today, are really 
if you will, I like this way of putting it, the, the patterns of common moral utterance in our culture, your culture, my culture, are really the graveyard for fragments of culturally dead, large-scale philosophical systems. They are largely the graveyard of these fragmented cultural experiences that are now dead, but we still use the language. We still use the words. So everyday moral arguments, whether you're in a bar, a boardroom, a newspaper, on television, anywhere where rival conclusions are being canvassed, we find remnants of the past. People using words they don't even know where they came from, but they're still using them because they're buried somewhere in the graveyard of the past, which is totally disconnected to the person's experience of reality and now. So whether it's your version of abortion or war or anything else, the words that are being used are basically remnants of the past that people have forgotten and don't remember what they are and where they came from, why they should be taken seriously, why we should even consider them as important. So contemporary moral philosophy is really like Polynesian discussions of taboo. So whether it's abortion, death and dying, marriage in the family, the place of religion in society, the relationship between justice and equality, justice and charity, justice and rights, all of them, all of those discussions, all of those arguments, all of those debates, are simply, if you will, an encounter between this wide range of, of truncated concepts and theories out of different pasts. So when you talk about morality, you've got to reconnect that with the historical reality from which it came and not just talk about morality. Words don't mean anything without their historical context. So I don't talk about good apart from a biblical sense of good, and that is rooted in the history of God's redemption revealed in the Bible. If I don't do that, we're just throwing words back and forth that have no real value. It's like asking, a Polynesian, what does taboo mean? They can't tell you. No one can, so we just make it up. We just pretend that it has some sort of value. You see, you know the word bricolage? A bricolage, you know what that is? A bricolage, if you've seen a, a, a bricolage, a, a artwork that's called bricolage, so you'll have a, 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 an artwork that's got a, 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 let's say, a piece of wire, a piece of uh, a plastic, it's got a piece of wood. It's got a, a piece of paper. It's made out of all these things that do not go together. So you basically just put together all these disparate things and that becomes your work of art. Well, that is our work of morality today. It's made up of all sorts of pieces that have no relationship to each other. They're just put together and we have a conversation with this person without going, wait a minute, where did that piece of plastic come from? Where does the paper come from? Why does that fit together with a piece of wood or a piece of metal? Your moral argument is just being made up out of whole cloth from a variety of sources, none of which have anything to do with each other. Now that's where you get into really good conversations about morality. Where are these words coming from? What are we talking about when we talk about good versus evil, bad, right, noble, virtue? Where does all that stuff come from? Well, I know where it comes from. Do you know where it comes from? Let's talk about where it comes from. And if we don't understand where it comes from, we're just throwing words at each other. They don't mean anything to people. So you can be as pro-life as you want to be, but until you get down to the dirty fact of what gives life value, then it's just words. They don't mean anything to people. So historical context is vitally important to the use of language when it comes to morality, to ethics, to goodness, 
to virtue. Deprived of their original context, they just become empty, meaningless words. They don't have any value whatsoever. So, uh, let's see. Any questions about that? Because we're going to have to stop. Any questions about any of that? You see, my wife grew up with this environment in her home. My wife's mother, I don't know if you ever heard of this newspaper columnist in America called Dear Abby? You ever heard of that? Well, it's a woman, she's a real woman, Abigail Van Buren. And anyway, she wrote letters in response to questions people would send to the newspaper about family, about values, about issues, whatever it might be. And they were called Dear Abby letters. And so some woman would write in, Dear Abby, how do you explain to your daughter what sex is without embarrassing yourself? Okay. And then Abby would write back, Dear Miss X, this is how you do it. And then she would tell you how to do it. So someone would write in, So, Dear Abby, how do you explain to your daughter that sex outside marriage is bad? Well, Dear Miss B, this is what you would say about sex, etc., etc. So my wife's mother's version of parenting was clipping out Dear Abby letters and leaving them on her bed. So she would come home from school and she would look on her pillow and there was a letter from Dear Abby explaining whatever you can imagine. A young girl. What does she need to know? And so my wife would read these stupid letters and she, and she would just sort of go, eh, and wad them up and throw them away, right? Why? Because Abby was using language that was from the 1950s or the 40s or the 30s when everybody agreed on what the meaning of the words was. But my wife was raised in the 60s. And those words had no value to her because she didn't even know where they came from. Those came from the Bible. And she had no idea what that was. So she wadded them up and threw them away. You see, if we don't introduce to our children where these things come from, they make no sense to them. They're like taboo rules. Why? We just don't do that sort of thing. Why don't I do this, Mom? Good people don't do that kind of thing. Oh, well, gee, that's really empowering, isn't it? Okay, so, so the very words you're using have no content to them. They mean nothing. And that's exactly the point we're making now. That to talk about morality in the 21st century requires a retrieval of the historical context, which is biblical, where these words came from and what they mean and why they mean what they mean. Or else we're having a meaningless conversation with people where he's saying one word and I'm saying another word and none of the twain shall meet. Nobody ever comes to an agreement about anything because we're not being honest about what our words really mean and where they come from. That sets the whole dynamic of a moral and ethical conversation that makes it meaningful, that makes it actually potentially productive. But beyond that, it's just cooks, sailors, asking why is it okay for men and women to have gratuitous sex but they can't eat a meal together? I don't know. It's taboo. It's bad. Well, that didn't help. And as a result, Polynesian culture basically was eradicated. It became New England Puritan culture. They had no reason not to because they had no relationship to the past that explained any of the things they did or didn't do. And that is, I'm afraid, 21st century Western culture. It's been totally eviscerated of its historical context. And thus it just becomes words, 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 which have no power and have no meaning. It wasn't a bad thing for Polynesians though. Hmm? It wasn't a bad thing for Polynesians, though. Well, it, it ended up being a very bad thing for Polynesians oh, really? because all it ended up in was a formal, uh, a, a formal uh, impersonation of a New England Puritan, 
What's a New England Puritan? It wasn't he believes in the God and Jesus and the Bible. A New England Puritan was somebody who wore a necktie and a certain kind of jacket and wore a white dress to a wedding and uh, ate with forks and knives. And uh, it was all about social customs and mores. A new set of taboos. No, a, a new set of taboos that they couldn't explain either. Where did that Why do you eat with a fork and a knife? Why don't you use your fingers? Oh, I don't know. I mean, the knife is an imitation of your hand, so you, you know, whatever. But that was the end result. They didn't have anything. They didn't even have their old taboos anymore. Now they had new ones that they couldn't explain either. So it was purely formal. It had nothing to do with real substance in their lives. Okay, we're through. Um, let me close this in prayer, okay? Father, we thank you again for this evening and for wisdom as we seek to work our way through these, these initial arguments about the controversy and crisis of talking about ethics in our modern world. Uh, give us wisdom that we might uh, regain a sense of perspective on, uh, on what it is you want us to be and what it is you wish us to do, that we might please you in all things. We ask that you would uh, teach us by your Spirit, unite your Spirit to your Word and make it powerful in our lives that we might be imitators of Christ and not imitators of men. And we ask that you would do this to your, your praise and to your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.